So, what's up? My name is Mike. Uh, and I'm going to be talking about HTML5 on TV, but actually, not really just HTML. Um, it's CSS, JavaScript, and UX, and other weird things, and bugs, lots of bugs. Um, so, I'm Mike. I live here in Austin, Texas. I work for Apple Software, which is a it's for a Norwegian browser maker. Um, and uh, as of yesterday, I'm on a new team called the Web Standards Team. I have no idea what my job is. Uh, my boss is traveling, so I'll let you know later. Um, and uh, I'm pretty famous, I would say. Uh, that's not actually true. So, uh, let's see if this works. to 
build a game, for example, that's just using the old Wii browser in your Wii mode, you can create JavaScript-based games and, and you know, fire events. Like here we have the pressed A button was fired. Um, and so it's got support for multiple Wii modes. Uh, pretty interesting. Curious to know if people ever kind of took this up and, and built the uh, internet games. Uh, that's not really what we're talking about, though. But but it's cool. We hit refresh. Video pics are broken. Okay. So any, anyways, Opera, Presto-based TVs and set-top boxes. There's uh, a lot of them, and you probably don't know if you had one. Um, for example, I have a Sony Blu-ray player that has an Opera TV in it. You wouldn't know that unless you read the fine print. Uh, yeah, wow, that's a really exciting slide, right? Um, there's, I don't think I'm allowed to announce this, but there's like a Swedish meatball manufacturer that's come out with Smart TV that has Opera uh, integrated. Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> sorry, I don't know. <laughs> Okay, so that's kind of like the three-minute version of Opera on TV. And that was really fascinating. So, so this is the part, kind of the interesting bits where you might learn something. Okay, so the user experience of a. So first of all, can you raise your hand if you have a smart TV or a TV that can browse the internet? All right. Um, Numbers. That was like 18 percent. Um, for those watching the video, there are thousands of people. Uh, don't mind my friend, please. So, raise your hand if you've ever like surfed the web on your TV. A little bit less. Right? It's terrible, in my opinion. Like, the, the interaction is just painful. Um, UX is, is something that. I think we need to really rethink and cater to the TV experience. Um, this is what my browser looks like when I fire it up on the Sony Blu-ray that was bought like six months ago. Right? That's that's legit. Right? Like someone in Japan said, "This is a great idea," um, and they're probably a fantastic person. Right? Um, enter a URL, push the options button, and it gives you this link. And it's really painful. And then you've, you've got this keyboard that pops up and you have to cycle through and double and double and double through. It's not like control at least log on. Yeah. I mean, but with one finger. Um, this is really the experience that we're used to when we're in front of a TV, right? Like, <coughs> I, I really like, I'm really proud of this image. But TV is, is ultimately a social experience. Right? You're sitting there with your significant other, your friends, your kids, whatever, and, and you're collaboratively watching something. You're watching a show, you're playing a video game, right? You're not like sitting there to check your Facebook private messages, have your mom come in or something. So keep that in mind as, as you're developing for TV. Like certain types of content just fundamentally will not work. Twitter, maybe. Um, I still think that's a little weird. Like publicly read tweets together. Um, so that's that was like five minutes of UX. Just think about that. Um, there's actually a ton of research uh, done by video game manufacturers that you can that you can read. Um, Microsoft's done a ton of work. They've published reports on this kind of stuff. Um, but I'm not really a UX guy, so I can't really speak much to it. Other than the fact that my own experience is that right now it's it's super awkward, um, but it can be nice. Um, does anyone know what overscan is? Do you remember? Long nose? Guy who took next to long nose? Chris knows. Um, I know everyone by name. Sorry, guy okay, who's sitting next to long um, <laughs> So, I, I love this image. This is one of the original design images for The Legend of Zelda. Um, this was like on Nintendo Power a few years ago. You can see they were. Figuring out, okay, let's let's draw what this is going to look like. Here's a potential thing, but I can't really point to it. Uh, yeah, I guess I can. 
right? You see this cross, and you see this cross, there's one there, there's one here. This is, this is them planning for overscan because um, TVs will display, I guess you could say, different parts of the image that's being broadcast. Um, historically, bits of information have been sent along on the side, you know, that'll help the, the TV to, to do alignment, or they would actually send metadata through that. Um, and so, there's this notion of overscan, right, where you have this action safe area, you have a title safe area, which is the middlemost, that's where the core information should be, and then you have this other stuff that, that could totally get cut off, right, like if you're watching this parade, you don't care about the, the dragon's keds or whatever those are. Um, you actually have to think about this when you're designing for TV because overscan is still a reality. Um, I have a flat screen TV. Um, it's, it's really cheap, but there's, there's no reason for overscan to exist in 2012, but um, it, it's, it was on by default. So I went to w3.org in my web browser. This was like, I was trying to think of a really short URL because it's so flipping hard to browse the web. So I go to w3.org and it's like, lo and behold, What's going on? Right? This is overscan. The header got chopped off. Um, it took me a while to figure out how to turn that off. All of a sudden, bam, and or I'm at. Right? So you can imagine building your site um, and like all your really important contact information or whatever is totally chopped off. So uh, the recommendation that our, our UX group gives is you want to give like a 10% all the way around padding, kind of as a don't put anything important. Navigation, which is totally different, right? We're, we're talking about how awkward it is. Um, we don't really have touch yet. In the future, I think we'll have companion devices that would be nice, but right now we've got this piece of crap. Um, it's a remote control. And if you're lucky, you'll have these four colored buttons up top, which are kind of special magic buttons, but there's no guarantee that those exist. Um, we'll talk about that in a second, but. Um, show you, hang on a second. So, has anyone ever heard of spatial navigation? This is, uh, hang on a second. So, spatial navigation is what happens when you're navigating the web with your keyboard. So this is also used in assistive technologies. This is how uh, remote controls navigate the web. So in, in Opera, you can, you can emulate this with shift. Like anyone can do this. Uh, okay, I'm gonna use shift. You can see this kind of blue focus line, which we're getting weird paint artifacts with the projector. Um, this is what it looks like when you're using your TV and you're pushing the right, the left, the up, and the down. Um, you can see how I'm interacting with that. So you can actually control the behavior of that focus box, where it goes. Um, there's a CSS3 module called the user interface module. Um, and it has these properties that are defined, which maybe aren't so well known because you really wouldn't interact with these unless you're in the TV context. You have this nav index, nav right, nav left, nav top, and nav bottom. And what you do is you give it an ID, and basically what you're saying is, if I'm on card A and I nav right, which maps to my right on my remote control, focus should hop to card B, right? And so this is how I can control the clockwise or the counterclockwise movement of my um, really sweet card game, right? Um, so another thing that's interesting about spat nav, spatial navigation, is how the cool kids say it is it'll, it'll react to mouse over and click events. Um, so you can write your code as if you weren't trying to do special things with remote controls, uh, but it'll work. So if you look at this code, um, take a second to see what's going on. Nothing super complex. Um, right, so I'm, I'm looping over the images, which are my cards. Um, I have this little log element, which is just kind of dump information. Basically, I'm saying if, if anyone clicks on a card, apply a toggle class, 
a rotate class, sorry. Um, and if anyone mouses over, show this log. So let's let's foo and odd. Right? So you, you can see the log changing. Right? This is a mystery. That's the pot. And then if I hit enter, which is what happens on the remote control, that's the same as clicking. Um, and it's rotated. Please hold your applause. Thank you. Awesome. Right, so there's actually events. I'm not going to go back to that. Uh, we'll come back to that in a second, right? But let's look at input. Okay, so remote control is awkward and weird, but there's actually ways that are defined by the W3C that you can uh, have special events you can listen for and special key constants. Fine. So we'll look at the constant. So you have this BK up, BK right, down left, etc. This is virtual key, as it were. Um, and so you can listen for these, and you can you can inspect the key event. Um, and you can say, oh, if, if BK up was pushed, whatever. Uh, move your pony up in your pony game. Um, so look at the comment. You can see you're guaranteed to have five of these. Right? All, all TV remotes are going to have up, down, left, right, and enter. Um, exit is there, but you can't really, it's, it depends on the, on the hardware. You can't really mess with it. But then you've got these optional things, blue, red, green, and yellow. Um, so check this out. Like, like imagine a scenario where you have an amazing app. Um, so you have an app that is, it's a cow, right? You push the cow and you feed it. You don't push the cow, it dies. Um, and you thought, oh, I have a green button, so I'm going to push the green button to feed it, right? Because that's like, cows like grass. Um, I haven't done any fact checking. I, I assume <laughs> cows like grass. Um, right? And so you say, when you push the green button, the cow gets fed, and that's awesome make millions of dollars. But it turns out half your user base doesn't have the green button and their cows all die. You're a terrible person, right? So, so this is how you would do that. You'd look at the key code and say, is this VK green or red constant present? Feed the cow. Um, like we said, that's not super safe. So you want to check if that exists, feed the cow, etc. Um, if not, create in your UI like something where they can, they can navigate to and click, etc. That was blazingly fast interaction and events. Um, CSS, the world of CSS, which is insane. Um, so if, I think there's been a couple talks about responsive design, and that's like the hot new thing. Um, it's been around for ever, really. Somehow got invented a few years ago. Um, if, if you read the spec, you'll notice that there's this TV media type, and you think, hooray, I can serve special TV style sheets to my TV users, and it turns out that this, like, forget this ever existed. You can't use this because TV is ignore it. Um, Google has said publicly, we'll never recognize this. Opera doesn't. I don't think we ever said it, we just don't. Um, the reason being that there's just too much content on the web that says media type of the screen. Right? So if you hit your website and all of a sudden the TV is saying, hey, I'm on the screen, I'm on the TV. CSS and everything is broken. Um, so you can't really use media queries for TV using the media attribute. Um, and then, then you think about it and you look at all the various different kinds of resolution for TV and you start to get angry because it's absurd the different resolutions, right? Um, absurd or awesome. Uh, you, you, there's, there's ways to work around this though, right? So these are the three media queries that we've recommended and used in our own products. So you've got full HD, right? Where it's, the min width is 1920 pixels, 1920 pixels. You've got HD ready, which I think my crappy TV is. I think that roughly translated to, to 720p, full HD being 1080p. And then you have smaller, which are the old TVs. Um, so you could really use these three what do you guys call these breakpoints? Is that right? Um, raising kids. You can use these three breakpoints to serve 
appropriate styles to uh, the different devices that you have all as well. Um, I'm going to come back to this maybe. Uh, but it's possible to do profiling on your CSS. Um, but if, if you care, come talk to me later. So, so what's the stories with libraries on TVs, right? Uh, you remember when we were trying to do a browser for the DS, it was super hard. Um, there wasn't a ton of memory. That's basically still the case for, for televisions. Um, it's wild that my, my phone was super powerful, yet my giant TV is, is crappy. Um, uh, does anyone know what this chart represents? You wouldn't unless you were looking. Yeah, so, so my friend uh, Matthias, you might know him, uh, brilliant kid, uh, Belgian developer, he tracks this. It's, this is the size of jQuery. Right? So uh, I took this before 1.9 came out. But if you look, so we have uncompressed, gzipped, minified, minified, gzipped. Um, you look at the general trend, obviously the library is getting rather hefty. Nearly 280k for jQuery. Um, obviously, that's super dramatic because the green line is the one you're supposed to care about because we all minify cheese in our code, right? All of us, yes. Yeah, that's what I thought. Um, point being, don't do this. Um, this is actual code from an actual TV application. The customer came to us and said, like, my, my application keeps crashing. What is going on? Nothing works. So you look and you're like, okay, you're pushing megabytes of JavaScript to a graphing calculator. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's not actually going to work. Um, like, modern browsers on relatively nice hardware, like, this is fine. You know? Like, it's not the end of the world. Like, the performance guys are going to upset, but it works. Um, but on TVs and phones, this isn't the nicest thing to do in the world. Um, So, what do you do? Right? So Thomas Fuchs made this MicroJS site, but, but the basic idea is you, you need smaller components, right? You don't need jQuery for a, a TV app. There's just too much there that's going on. If you need a, a small event binding library or you need some kind of selector library, that's great. You can find those. Uh, it's it's not even that hard to write your own. Um, you guys saw like the four lines of code I had for my silly card game. Just using native DOM APIs, we're <laughs> adding classes for uh, interaction, etc. Right, so you can check out the vanilla JS framework. It's pretty sweet. Um, okay, so perhaps this is the part of the talk that you maybe came for. This is the part where I'm talking about HTML5. But I'm mostly going to talk about how broken it is. So um, a while ago, uh, our good friend Dion, he wrote this blog post called HTML5 is a jewel that we need to cut into a weapon. Um, I have no idea what that means. Uh, but I found this gif of a diamond, so it worked. Um, okay, so on, on your TV, this is stuff you do have and stuff that works, right? We've got basically ES5.1, so you can use all the, the fantastic stuff, um, ES5. You've got native binary data you can push to your TV, which is crazy. But you can do it. The performance is terrible, right? You've got typed arrays. Um, so we've got all this really cool JavaScript stuff that basically works. Um, I've never run into a bug where you're like, oh crap, math random doesn't work. You know, it's all there. Um, the problem, as you might expect, is when you get to the DOM, um, this stuff breaks all over the place. Right, so storage is interesting. Um, Estelle, in her talk, she was talking about a couple of the storage APIs you can use in the browser. It's exciting. Yeah, I can store little bits of text um, through various mechanisms. It turns out this is uh, different on TV, right? So if you go to whatever website this is, it's Google Bypass, and you look at your TV and you're like, yeah, I've got local storage. That's fantastic store my app in there, um, 
and then you look and see how much you're able to actually store. This is, I was actually pretty excited when I found out, I'm like, oh, I've got 47 k right? It's actually half of that, because local storage text stores UTF-16 uh, in the browser, so it's like you get half of what you're looking at. Um, so we're at 23k worth of strings, that's not so bad. Um, some of my colleagues' DVDs have zero, like they'll just explode if you put anything in there. Um, this is really up to the device integrator, right? So the Sony Blu-ray player guys, they did a pretty good job, right? They hooked me up with session storage. Um, some of the other people might not think about it or, or break it or whatever. Um, same thing goes with cookies. Cookies work, um, but the weird thing we found was uh, turned off your TV and you lost all your data, right? You lost your session cookies, you lost everything in local storage and session storage, and you're hosed and you're frustrated. So yeah, what's the solution? You have to kind of think back, back right, to yesterday when you were storing information on the server and things like okay, that, because that sounds, it's really the best solution there is for TV um, if you have critical functionality, right? Um, yeah, poof, it's gone. So the story for audio video is maybe less terrible. Um, it really depends. So the good news is all the TVs support H.264. Like it's all natively on the hardware. You don't have to worry about different versions, um, which, is, which is great news because that's a pain in the neck. Um, bad news is for certain devices, you can only have one plane at a time, right? You can have side-by-side -side videos. That's what we do, um, which perhaps is an issue for, for games and sound effects having multiple audio elements. Um, and sometimes the Events misfire, which is kind of a pain in the neck. Um, okay, so those are kind of like the main things to keep in mind. All this stuff is is documented uh, in greater detail on our uh, dev.opera.com blog. If you want to just go look for TV stuff, so uh, if you're interested. So in terms of tooling, there are tools, right? So we make this thing called the Opera TV emulator. Which I think is pretty nice. If you don't have a smart TV, or even if you do, you probably still want to use this. Um, we've, we've packaged this up as just a virtual box image. So you can just click on that and you're good to go. Um, and with that, we've got this kind of, when you fire it up, it starts a local server. Um, and you've got this little remote control emulator, so you can test that all that stuff is working. Um, Opera Dragonfly, which is the name of our developer tools. You could do remote debugging against your TV emulator instance. Um, and so what that means is you connect it and then you're able to inspect from your browser what's appearing in theory on your TV, um, which is nice. So for example here, you, you can't see because it's tiny. I've, I've manipulated and I've changed the name of Butt to Shusha. Does anyone know who Shusha is? Anyone? Big fan in the back? Um, right, so you click on your Shusha button. This joke goes really well in Brazil. Um, <laughs> if you're there in the 80s, right? Um, and then you've got a, a full rebel that you can do stuff against, which is sweet. So, so Dragonfly works with the TV emulator, and you can just Google that and download it, and it's great. I'll, I'll show you what it looks like in a second. But uh, the TV store, so this exists, it's a thing. You can go here, this is kind of, I mean, it's, it's an app store for TV apps, right? Um, let me show you, we're not gonna wait for that. Let me show you what it looks like, I'm gonna pause it. The resolution sucks, I apologize. But, um, so these are the apps you have installed. Um, this, is, this is my favorite app, we're gonna play this one together. I have a six-year-old son, Pearson, who thinks this is the coolest thing in the world. Hopefully our internets will work. Right, so this is called MathNet. This is kind of an example of, I think, a super cool example of what an app on TV can be, how it can be uh, interactive, interesting. We won't be able to see everything because of uh, projector stuff, but let's, 
Let's start this game. Thank you. 